The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins from the Society of St. Pius V, pastor of Immaculate Conception Church in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. Hello, Tim. How are you doing? Good, Father. We've got a whole slate of emails for tonight, so let's jump right in. And we have a couple uh, in regards to the new Mass. The first question here says, I am working through the issues involving the new Mass. I'm wondering why the architects of the new Mass chose to have the priest face the people which seems uh, when it seems they could have chosen most anything for the priest to face. A rock, a tree, the sun, an animal, for instance, or some sort of idol created from wood. If the priest does not face God and his prayers, then what does it really matter where he faces? Why would they prefer the people over any created thing? Well, because the Novus Ordo is a step in the direction of a one-world religion in which deifies the humanity. And so, and, and the priest um, is not really a priest in the Catholic sense, uh, in the Novus Ordo. He's a minister. And he actually represents the people, like a Protestant minister. Yeah? So, uh, of course, do away with the altar, because an altar is, an, uh, uh, is where you offer sacrifice, uh, put in its place at table. Uh, where you have a meal, a communal meal, and he's sitting across, he's standing across the table from, from the people at the meal, from the family at the meal, from the guests at the meal, and they're all going to share a meal together. You know? And so his prayers are really addre addressed to them. Um, the idea of the tabernacle where our Lord Himself is present, and the with uh, the crucifix above it, and uh, the priest facing that, and and required to look at the crucifix from time to time, you know, at the beginning, certain prayers and so on. Uh, that is all gone now. I mean, even the relics are gone. Again, you don't have an altar at the table there. The relics of the martyrs required for all the centuries, you know, wherever Mass would be altered, offered. Uh, now, uh, they've done away with that. So uh, it really is a, a communal meal. <clears throat> they, they call it that in number seven of the general instruction on the Roman Missal that came out with the new Mass, it uh, says this, the Lord's Supper, parentheses, or Mass, close parentheses, is the gathering together of the people of God under the presidency of the priest to, uh, uh, let's see, to celebrate the memorial of the Lord. That's what they say, to celebrate the memorial of the Lord. And then they even continue there after a period. They say, therefore, it is particularly true of a celebration of a local community. Uh, what our Lord says, where, I, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Okay? So it, it refers to merely a spiritual presence of Christ and um, <clears throat> our Lord being in the midst of the people. And that is where you have to look for him. So, uh, now, that was uh, the original uh, definition of the, of the new Mass given in the general instruction of the Roman Missal when it first came out. It was subsequently changed to reflect a more traditional understanding of the Mass as a, the, uh, the embodied sacrifice of Calvary. And some people would say, well, look, they, now they got it right. They, they redefined it. But you say, wait a minute now. They might have slapped another definition on it that is more traditional, but it remains what it was, and that it was what it was originally designed to be. The Lord's Supper, um, in which the priest presides over uh, the people, as a celebration of the memorial of the Lord. You know, you know have, a, have a memorial service, you just get to get to remember that Jesus died for us long, long ago, far, far away. Does the new Mass do that? Yes, the new Mass does, in fact, remember that, that event. Uh, it does talk about the Last Supper. It talks about our Lord taking the bread, talks about our Lord taking the wine, talks about him saying words, 
But those words are no longer the words of consecration. In the new mass, they're called the narrative of institution. Narrative is a story. They're telling a story at the new mass. You know? <clears throat> so there are so many indications uh, surrounding the new mass, despite the fact that uh, subsequent uh, emendations were made because of objections. The new mass remains exactly what it was designed to be, an ecumenical service and you bring to it whatever you believe or don't believe. You can interpret your own way. It is ambiguous enough. Uh, it is what we call heterodox, because it is open to interpretation. And that's why it is so dangerous, precisely because uh, being open to interpretation, it lends itself more and more to unbelief. It undermines belief that is there. If it were out and out, uh, let's say, um, uh, her heretical, you know, in, su in such a way that there was no Catholic way to understand it or, or, or accept it. It was just a, a direct confrontation with Catholic belief, a direct denial of Catholic belief. Then, uh, you know, Catholic people, by and large, would have rejected it. Absolutely. They didn't want that, though. You know? So they wanted to uh, load the syringe and inject it, you know. Um, and that's how they got the people to take the inoculation. That's how they got the people to drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, you know, they, they uh, made it ambiguous enough that people would say, well, this is come to, coming to us from Rome, and, um, you know, I, I can't put my finger on it. It makes me uneasy, but I'll accept it because I have to trust them. Yeah. Um, and that, that's why it is a very deadly poison, poison the new mass. That's why they have the, the minister, He's, he represents the people, you know, um, like a Protestant minister over a table. And uh, he is one of them, but he's the leader of the community. He's presiding over them, you see. He's not an other Christ. He's presiding over the people. That's his role. That's why he faces them as a president of an assembly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a good point about Protestantism, Father, because it, it seems that, that this is all about uh, the, the Protestant idea now, where mm -hmm. it's all about the people, it's all about the minister, and I think if you go to any uh, type of Protestant service or anything, it's all about the preacher and his message, where mm -hmm. actually, there, there's no sacrifice being offered. And actually, in the traditional Catholic idea, the, the priest's sermon is actually the least important part of, of the whole service, because that's mm -hmm. not actually part of, of the sacrifice of the Mass being right, offered. The, the Mass would still be the same without it. Exactly. You know, the priest's word. It's, it's Christ's uh, word, and Christ's presence that matters. It, it reminds me, Father, I believe I, I've heard this story from you, where I, I think it was an archbishop, perhaps, here in, in Cincinnati, mm -hmm. who... Uh, who almost com complained, I, I think, of, of having too many priests and not knowing what to do with all of the priests he had. Right. And I, I believe you, you made the, the former point former Archbishop of, of Cincinnati. Yeah, I believe you made the point, though, of what what about all the masses that these priests were offering? Did they have did they have no value? And to him, they didn't because they have lost all concept of the sacrifice of the mass. It, it's all just about the people. And if there's no mm -hmm. people attending these masses, mm -hmm. if there's no people uh, having this communal mm -hmm. celebration, then they're of no value. No well, he pointed out that there were too many priests before. I wanted to congratulate him and tell him he found a great way to get rid of all those extra priests. <laughs> because then he, he, they were in the middle of this For the Harvest program here in Cincinnati. And he said it was a wonderful thing because the lack of priests uh, required the lay people to stand up and take their rightful place in leading the liturgy. So this was a great success in his mind. Yeah. But see, that's why we have to understand the modernists considered the destruction of the, of the traditional church as a success for them. They, they applaud themselves for it. They're as shrewd as uh, serpents. Huh? They're definitely as shrewd as serpents. They're as, they're as guileless as serpents, as too. As serpents. You know, when they have the, the Novus Ordo minister there, standing there with his big floppy vestments, maybe rainbow color, or with Snoopy or butterflies or whatever, and he's standing there, uh, he picks up the, the, the huge taco host, you know, and uh, notice, he says the words, um, amended words, they, they corrected the words of Christ, you know, in the, uh, in the words of the narrative of institution. And uh, he says the words over the taco, and then he, he holds it up. First thing he does is elevate it. So everybody... And the whole, uh, and the whole place uh, can look at it in silence for a moment. Then he puts it down, back on the table again, and then he genuflects. He does the same thing with the cup. 
And um, what what is the difference between that and the, and the traditional mask? By the way, Maybe, did you catch a, a difference there? Does it genuflect beforehand? Uh, right. In the traditional mask, exactly. The the priest pronounces the words of Christ in the person of Christ, and the first thing he does is genuflect in adoration, because it is the body of Christ. He consecrates the blood, the wine, and the chalice, the blood of Christ, and immediately he genuflects in adoration before elevating it. Uh, why the change? You know, was it was it an oversight? Was it something? that said, "Oops, we left that out. How could we have overlooked that?" It was not an oversight. They knew exactly what they were doing. In the in the Novus Ordo, the minister elevates the host because it's the assembly that makes the body of Christ for them the body of Christ. It becomes for them the body of Christ, even as it says in their new so-called offertory prayers. It will become for us, you know, our spiritual bread. It will become for us our spiritual drink, whatever that is. Yeah. So the whole assembly basically ratifies what the priest says, and uh, and that's why he will not quote unquote adore uh, the the host or what's in the chalice until after the entire assembly has basically consented to what he has said on their behalf, mm -hmm. that it is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Father, let, let's talk more about this uh, validity of the Novus Ordo Eucharist, because we have a question here uh, in regards to that, uh, which says, about a year ago, Bishop Williamson was doing some Q&A, and the question of the validity of the Novus Ordo Eucharist was brought before him. He replied by saying that he is absolutely not advocating for people to attend the Novus Ordo. However, he said that going by evidence alone, there is possibility that their Eucharist is valid because of recent Novus Ordo Eucharistic miracles, where discarded hosts placed in the tabernacles observably turn to blood and flesh after a few days. He openly admitted that by saying this, he would agitate some traditionalists, but nevertheless, he insisted that the observable as well as the scientific evidence is in favor of the possibility of the Novus Ordo's validity, which he himself cannot explain. Okay, well, that's uh, lamentable uh, that he can't explain that. Uh, when I was uh, still a seminarian out in California, um, I actually had a, uh, a gentleman who was about my age at the time. He was probably, uh, you know, late teens, you know, early 20s. Uh, he told me about something that had happened in a nearby Novus Ordo church. Okay, this, I'm talking back in the 19, like about 1970, right? Uh, he said that the um, the corporal, you know, which is the white linen cloth on which the host and the chalice are set during the during the liturgy, and you know, in which the body and blood of Christ are consecrated, the corporal during one of the Novus Ordo masses, <coughs> one, of, one of the Novus Ordo liturgies, I guess you'd say, celebrations, uh, was transformed into this torn, dirty rag. Actually, during the, the, the liturgy, the, the celebrant held it up for everyone to see that it had become this, this torn, dirty rag right there before their very eyes. <clears throat> he said, now isn't that evidence for the validity? And I said, uh... Not really. <laughs> Frankly, I mean, I would take that as a God's statement that, well, this is what you're offering me now, you know? Yeah. Uh, you're offering me uh, basically so something that, that, that is a, an atrocity, that you're all, yeah, and, and not, not at all pleasing to God. You're, it's like you're crucifying me again, you know? Um, but, um, I mean, even even moving to what uh, what he's saying here, I'd have to say, if, first of all, what tabernacle is he talking about? Where are these tabernacles? In the Novus Ordo churches, they're usually off to the side somewhere, in some side room, if not a glorified broom closet, then perhaps even some places where you know there might be some modicum of dignity. But seldom are they front and center on an altar, right? They're certainly not on the table. We're in the way, they're in the way of the celebration there. So where are these tabernacles he's talking about? And these hosts uh, that they're using, the, these, they are, they're, they're this, I, I can't I'd say consecrated because 
I don't believe they really are, on a table at the Novus Ordo, uh, handed out to people left and right, right? Confession, no confession, mortal sin, annulment, who knows what else they've got going on. And then taken over and put in this, this container off to the side that often looks like some meteorite or something that crashed you know, to Earth from, from outer space. <clears throat> now, I would say, okay, if there is something that happens in, uh, behind the door of that, uh, uh, that so-called tabernacle of theirs, <clears throat> I would say either it's either the work of the devil to deceive people, or it is God's way of saying that you're crucifying me again. You know, that this is what you are doing to me. And trying to um, make a statement to, the, to those involved in this, in this, in this uh, Nova sort of atrocity. But in no way would I interpret uh, even the, 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 the fact of these things, if it is a fact, if they are facts. You know, I don't know. The jury's out. I mean, how do I, how can I presume that these things are true? But assuming that they are true, nonetheless, okay, I would say the interpretation of the meaning of them uh, certainly, uh, I think, is very far-fetched mm -hmm. in terms of uh, what he's making of this. Right? Mm -hmm. And I, I thought the, uh, the the emailer here said, <coughs> made a great point when they said that uh, that they would point out by saying that many of the Eucharistic miracles throughout history happened because of the unbelief of I, the priests or the parish. I was just going to say the same thing. Yeah, yeah. the miracle of Lanciano, mm -hmm. the result of unbelief. Yeah. So um, I mean, there's, there's just no way that I can see to interpret this in such a way that it in any way endorses the Novus Ordo and makes it any kind of a source of grace mm -hmm. or an occasion of grace. Um, I mean, uh, one may say, well, look, look at the crucifixion. I mean, that was a source of all the graces, right? Yes, but it was our Lord's enemies who did that to him, you know. And uh, in the Novus Ordo, you know, our Lord can make the same point, certainly make the same point. Definitely. Uh, well, we uh, got another question here, Father, concerning uh, Vatican II. And uh, the viewer says, I've heard the claim that it has historically been a Catholic teaching that the Jews, as a people, hold the guilt for the killing of Jesus before this teaching was recanted at Vatican II. Is this true? Is it true that the Church regarded the Jews as having that... <clears throat> the Catholic Church was simply going on the basis of what is recorded in the Gospel, that when Pontius Pilate <clears throat> was saying to them, you have the responsibility, I'm washing my hands, their response was, the leader of the people made that response, his blood be upon us and upon our children. They called that down upon them. <clears throat> and so the Church has simply acknowledged that they deliberately invoked that upon themselves. Now, <clears throat> that is a far cry from saying that each and every Jewish person you know, bears the responsibility for the crucifixion and death of the Son of God on the cross. Uh, I would have to say, if I thought of that that way, I would have to say, I also bear that responsibility. Because I, I'm, I'm not sinless, right? and I know that. And um, as far as how God will hold them responsibility individually and how he will hold me responsibility individually, I'm much more concerned about how he will hold me responsibility because I know the graces that I've received. And I know the graces that I've received not only in, through baptism but through the ordination of the Holy Priesthood uh, and having been so close to him day after day after day at the altar, I'm very much aware of my own personal responsibility. So, um, you know, that's much more significant to me personally, you know, uh, than this particular question. But uh, I would say this also, that the Church also knows that the Apostles were all Jewish. The Blessed Mother herself, right, of uh, offspring of Abraham, and same, same with St. Joseph, right, tribe of David, and um, the earliest martyrs of the faith, right, um, and uh, not only that, but in the end times, it is from the tribes of the offspring of, uh, of Abraham, right, the, the 12 tribes of Israel, that God will take uh, the champions who are going to lead the resistance to the Antichrist and uphold the faith. And they will be marked with the sign of, of Christ. They will be marked with the, the sign of God on their foreheads, right? 
Um, so, from the apostles to those valiant souls, the 144,000 spoken of in chapter 7 of the book of the Apocalypse, I mean, the church also acknowledges that greatness there, too. Um, so, you know, nowadays, um, people like to, to, to point that out as to uh, how bad the church was, how anti Semitic, and so on. It's not true. Um, individual Catholics, yes. Individual Christians, yes. I mean, individual atheists and pagans, too, are <laughs> very prejudiced, right? But actually, uh, the church assigns very high places in heaven. Uh, reigning with Christ, the apostles, and every one of them was Jewish. Mm -hmm. Were any of the church's yeah. traditional teachings regarding the, this matter changed at, uh, during Vatican II? Uh, during and after Vatican II, they had Nostra Aetate, uh, which, curiously enough, was uh, primarily the work of a, of a homosexual. Now they can say prejudice there, too. But it was primarily the work of a homosexual. But he didn't want his homosexuality to be known then. He came out later and he professed that, but said that he hid it during Vatican II because he didn't want that to get in the way of the Declaration. You know? But he was obviously uh, had an agenda to push, to push the church in, in a certain direction, and, and he succeeded in doing so. Um, <clears throat> but in any case, uh, Nostra Aetate was again um, put on the table to um, undermine the whole idea of a true faith in the one true son of, of the one true God, and the one true sacrifice of Calvary for the for the salvation of mankind. Uh, Nostra Aetate is uh, something that was meant to deal a death blow to that to that whole concept, and it it is an atrocity. Okay. Uh, let's move on then, Father. We have our next question concerning the communion of the saints. Here, um, this viewer says that I have read some things by ostensible traditional Catholics that seem to add confusion to this doctrine. One recently stated that Jesus mediates the covenant, but our other petitions are to be mediated by the saints. That did not sound right to me, but it seems that we can become so involved in invoking the prayers of the saints in heaven that we neglect praying straight to Jesus. Please explain how there is no real contradiction here. Okay, I'm sorry, this author, this writer said that he heard this from, from who now? An ostensible traditional Catholic. An ostensible traditional Catholic, okay. I'd rather be rather ostensible, the ostensible <laughs> traditional Catholics. Um, so that the, the petitions for what? Mediated by Christ? Uh, and all others by the saints. Jesus mediates Christ. the covenant, but our other petitions are covenant. to be mediated by the saints. I've never heard anything expressed this way in the Catholic faith. I'm not sure where this individual got this. Um, if he was trying to, if he said he was referring to something he'd read somewhere, or I, I don't know. But there is one mediator between between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. We know that. that that's a fact. Everything has to go through him. Absolutely everything. Even our, our prayers to the Blessed Lady. They have to go through our Lord. If they, got, they have to go through the cross, they have to go through Calvary. You know? So one cannot say to the exclusion of our Lord, the saints are going to mediate all these other things. Okay, But Christ is the mediator of the covenant. Um, I mean, I, I think if you, if you, I think you could say that that was actually heretical. <laughs> Frankly, um, I don't know if word for word it has ever been condemned, you know, but nonetheless, I, I think it certainly implies uh, um, uh, something heretical. You know? So, um, no, no, whatever mediatorship there is, whatever mediator's role there is on the part of any of the saints in heaven or any of the priests on earth. It is derived from Christ himself, who is the high priest and the sacrifice. And there can be nothing mediated that does not go right you know, to our Lord and through him to the Father. No one can come to me except the Father draw him, right? And no one can come to the Father except through me. And that's what earlier said. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't see how that leaves any, any room to interpret things that, that way. Yeah, and you know, Father, that's, that's a common charge against Catholics that we worship Mary or, or, or worship the saints or, or whatever. But I think it's always great to point out that uh, 
that what the traditional Catholic Church actually teaches is that if a person worships Mary or any of the saints mm -hmm. for a single instant and they don't repent of that, just that single instant of, of worshiping, paying to Mary or the saints the homage that is due to God for one single instant and not repenting of that is enough to condemn them to hell for all of eternity. Well, it's, it's, it's actually idolatry. I mean, exactly. if, if it's formal, if it's not just the result of some gross ignorance, yeah. you know. But even then, I mean, it's, it's pretty egregious. Yeah. Um, I mean, St. Thomas Aquinas even raises the question of the validity of baptism. And he says if the priest were to say, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, and the Blessed Virgin Mary, he says if, if the priest's intent were, we're not a good priest, you know, because, because the church says that someone else can baptize, a lay person can baptize. Even a non-Catholic can validly baptize, you know. Of course, they're not supposed to do so, except in a real emergency and someone is dying. Otherwise, without the, the, sacra the, the sacrament of baptism. That if the person has the notion <clears throat> that there's a blessed quadernity, <clears throat> four persons in God, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and the Blessed Mother, Mary, as though she's one of the divine persons, that would be heretical to the point of invalidating the baptism. This, that, that very misbelief, as it were. If, if someone added Our Lady's name uh, in a misguided attempt to honor her and just say, well, you know, she's great in the eyes of God, and she's in heaven, and she, she also, you know, loves this child and has a certain spiritual motherhood for the child that Christ gave to her on the cross. Maybe he's making all these ideas that that's why he's going to just kind of toss Our Lady's name in there. It would be gravely sinful for him to do so on the face of it. It wouldn't necessarily invalidate the baptism, though. But if there were an idea that is totally contrary to truth, that Mary is a divine person, then that would invalidate the baptism. Okay. And St. Thomas Aquinas wrote this in the middle of the 1200s. So, so I mean, a, the Catholic Church has always been very clear in her pronouncements that Mary herself, even receiving the the gift, uh, the the the, the uh, as a revocation from our Lord to be the mother of the Son of God, and all of the other privileges that were given to her, received them as privileges, not as rights. They were gifts that God gave to her, and she cooperated with them fully, and that's why we honor her. Um, so she she certainly couldn't have earned them from her immaculate conception all the way to her assumption. Um, no one could earn such things. So the free gifts of Almighty God. And did Our Lady in, in any sense show herself worthy of them? Only insofar as she cooperated with them. Absolutely. Um, with with uh, in her entire mind and her entire will. Right? Her, she completely was the handmaid of the Lord. You know? So, yes, she did, fully, completely. That's why she was full of grace. You know? Because there was nothing in her that resisted grace. It completely filled her, everything in her. All right. Next question, then, Father. This should be an interesting discussion here. Uh, this viewer says, almost immediately after the Red Revolution in Russia, atheism, abortion, divorce, and homosexuality were instituted by government to eradicate the moral foundation of the people. In light of these instituted errors in our country, is our precious land substantially communist? Well, Our Lady said at Fatima that the consequences of failure to do what she asked, that is spread devotion to her immaculate heart, right? And to stop sitting and offending God, of course, praying the rosary and consecrating Russia to her immaculate heart. Failure to do those things would result in Russia spreading her errors throughout the world. <clears throat> There was a failure to do these things. We have to accept the fact that what we're witnessing is Russia spreading her ass throughout the world. And so I would have to say, uh, yes, that's exactly what we're witnessing. We're witnessing our country becoming communist, <clears throat> Marxist, okay? I mean, when you say communism, Tom, you, know, you, you always have to realize <clears throat> communism is actually like the embodiment of the system. It's the practical result of the system. but. You know, communism is a, is a, is a, is a myth. Uh, communism is, is presented as the ultimate outcome of following <clears throat> Marx's philosophy, 
so-called, and the practical, the practical uh, steps, you know, that, that follow from it. The idea, you know, when we talk about communism, what we're really talking about is the, the mirage that, Mar that Marx had, <clears throat> that in the end, there would be no more private property, <clears throat> and therefore there would be no more conflict among men. It would become the workers' paradise on earth. They would need no more government. <clears throat> and therefore, we'd all live in this great commune. Right? This is communism. This is the dream that it has. <clears throat> it is utopia, you know? <clears throat> it's, it's, it's completely um, uh, dreamed up, you know, by Karl Marx and other utopians who want to recreate human nature, uh, usually at the, end of a, uh, at the end of the barrel of a gun, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to impose their concept of how things must be. Right? They're leftists. That's what they do. They're leftists. Um, <clears throat> all they know is lying. <clears throat> they have to lie because they're making all this up. And everything has to fit their lie. So ultimately, they're working toward a, a great lie, the big lie, as Father Vicelli used to say. So they have to lie every step of the way to make it fit. You know? And also violence, they believe in that. But that's, that's, that's Mar Karl Marx's meat and potatoes. The dialectic that Francis, that Francis himself encourages in theology, the dialectic. Thesis, antithesis, and synthesis, <clears throat> it involves destruction, violent destruction, absolute um, Clash, uh, bloody, bloody clashes, right? Of the classes of men, uh, so that history can progress. It's all by blood and misery and sorrow. So when a Marxist foments revolution, and uh, the more blood he sheds, the greater his success at bringing mankind closer to a communist world of paradise on earth, right? classless society, no private property. This is the Marxist measure of success. How many billions of gallons of blood he can shed on. Uh, but anyway, uh, you see this going on in our own country these days. He talks about you know our country becoming communist. This is what's happening here. Uh, this is the kind of thing that just happened in uh, South Carolina. Right? Um, you know, the, the so-called alt-right showed up with the Klan, and the thugs showed up from alt-left with clubs, and they were ready to have a big rumble. Then that's what they—that's what they—that's exactly what they wanted. Um, but in, in any case, the the errors of Russia, though, really go deeper than this. Because if you were to look at the error of Karl Marx, I mean, the fundamental error of Karl Marx is his atheism. But even there, you know, Marx dealt with the question or addressed the question, do we have to impose our atheism on all those who would embrace Marxism and the communist cause? <clears throat> do we have to require that of them from the outset, that they drop any faith in God, embrace, Marx, uh, embrace atheism in order to allow them <clears throat> to join our ranks? His answer was no. He says, they'll figure it out. In the course of time, they will lose their faith in God if they embrace Marxism. <clears throat> so, uh, send a uh, you know a postcard to Francis, okay? <clears throat> and uh, let him know that he's he's succeeding in his Marxist principles and where he's taking everyone here. But regardless, um, <clears throat> that is the great error of Marxism, atheism. But remember, atheism means that. Well, who's left? And that's us. We're left to be God, right? And so what he wants to <clears throat> take is human nature, and he wants to alter it. Um, <clears throat> remember that everything, everything in his philosophy is about the economy. <clears throat> is America Marxist? When you have a Bill Clinton, who in the height of the campaign simply remarks, and becomes famous for it. It's the economy, stupid. It's the economy, stupid, he says, okay? Because you're stupid if you don't realize it's all about the economy. That's all that matters. He's addressing 
his fellow Marxists, because that's exactly what Marx said. Man is an economic animal, period. <clears throat> no God, no soul, <clears throat> nothing. As St. Paul says, <clears throat> his God is his stomach, right? And uh, his glory is his shame. <clears throat> Perfect expression of what Marxist, a Marxist man is. So when Our Lady says the Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, <clears throat> having denied God, <clears throat> that's what man is left. That's what's left of mankind. Economic animals, the herd, the masses of humanity. Right? That's all. And they are meant to be treated nothing but, nothing but cannibal, like, like livestock, you know. And yeah, we're there, we're there too. That's what they're doing, that's what they're doing in the schools, Common Core, all the things. They're just basically raising animals, they're raising livestock. Uh, they have no ability to think for themselves, right? Um, there are accounts from Russia of what became of the Russian peasantry after the Bolshevik Revolution. <laughs> And the, the stories there are horrific, and basically that's what you see, reduced to the level of the most, uh, just the most base animal activity. But remember, <clears throat> you may even forget, you may even get human beings to, to forget or deny that they have souls, but they still have souls. And so they may be degraded to the level of an animal, but they won't stay there long because they become demons. They will they must eventually become demons mm -hmm. and do things to themselves and to others that no animal would do to itself or to other animals even. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we're, we're, we're there. We're well on our way there, certainly. Yeah, in regards to that, that point about, <laughs> about uh, animals, rather, I've heard it said before that uh, the, the, the evil of, of mankind is actually proof of, of the fact that they have a soul because uh, <clears throat> one way I've heard it put before is that there are lions that want to kill zebras, but you'll never meet a lion that wants to kill every zebra on the face of the earth. But you do encounter that, that level. But just for the sheer fun of it. Yeah, you do encounter that level yeah. of, of depravity and, and, and fallen man. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've heard it said to the Father that, uh, that communism is the outcome and socialism is the road to get there. That's exactly right. And I think that you can you can see that clear as day in our country, like with the, the protests that you have, with the dialectic that's, that's being encouraged. An interesting point about the uh, the, the riots you were talking about, I, I think there, there were several articles um, online and, and different things going around talking about where, where were the police during this time, how the police yeah. stood by, they had orders yeah. to, to stand by and just yeah. let all this happen, almost as if this, this is, being, all set up. is being encouraged, yeah. this, this, all of these, these riots, this dialectic, this, this class warfare, yeah. this is exactly what they want because it's right in line with Marxist uh, ideology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but and what is necessary then? More police presence, more control, yeah. right? More government yeah. to rescue us from all of this. Mm -hmm. Abs absolutely, it's the same. we saw the same thing in the French Revolution. Yeah. The devil learns. You look back into the last several hundred years of revolution, you see that he's learned quite a bit. He he knows how to manipulate. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, you know, you go back to the uh, French Revolution Committee of Public Safety, right, to keep the people safe. <laughs> Go to our college campuses, right? The snowflakes. Safe right? space. Oh, they've got to be kept safe. Even from the thought of Trump, you know, yeah. they feel threatened by this. And uh, these are precisely the type of people who uh, the, the Marxists want. To. This is the type that they want. The Marxists want to breed these people. Why? Because they can control them. Mm -hmm. And Father, you, you mentioned earlier about the, the school systems, the public school systems, how they're, they're, they're dealing with that. And uh, as myself uh, being s in some manner involved in the uh, our public school system here in Cincinnati, have, kind of having an outside uh, view on that, I, I've seen uh, many of their initiatives there. And they have this, this big program that they're pushing now about focusing on the whole child rather than, than not just the education. Mm -hmm. And now in our schools, we're going to set up community health centers. Mm -hmm. We're going to set up all these networks where kids can stay after school, where their focus is on the whole child. Well, it and does take a village, you know. It takes a village. Yeah, as as Hillary favorite. famously said. Their, but, their favorite mantra. Uh, yeah, yeah. Without parents. But that's what the communists did. You know, Father John Becker said that's the first thing the communists under Mao Zedong yeah. did, was they took the children away from their mother and father yeah. and they raised them communally. Yeah. 
uh, so they could be raised as good communists. Because the Communist Party knows uh, they will not share allegiance. You, a child cannot love his mother, love his father. He's got to love the party. He's got to love Chairman Mao. He's got to love uh, chair, uh, uh, Secretary of the Party Stalin. He's got to. That's where his allegiance has to be. And it not only is it, is it primarily that way, it's exclusively. He has to have this exclusive allegiance to the party and the leader of the party who embodies you know, the so-called the, the, the god of communism, small g. Um, this, this is what uh, all of this is about. This is a setup for the coming of the Antichrist, you know, who will demand the absolute allegiance of every man, woman, and child in the face of the earth, you know, because that's what Satan does. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. This is a step in that direction to uh, uh, try to get there. And I think, that, I think they're speeding there very quickly right now, actually. Mm -hmm. And Francis is helping them. Definitely. Yeah, he's working with them hand in glove. Yeah, I always thought it was fascinating. By the way, after reading reading Mark's work and his manifest on all that, just how how frankly how stupid it is. Uh, there, there's no there's no molecule of, of sense behind anything he says. Every prediction that he ever made turned out to be completely and utterly wrong. Mm -hmm. um, he just and the whole thing is just based on all of his his ideas. Everything is just based on envy. And, and greed and uh, it's it's just the the most sad thing and it's it's, it's fascinating hatred it's, it's amazing how, how so many people can fall for that and so many people um, can can just go go right along with that but I think that it's just like you said it, it's utopia where you have the socialism that's leading to, that's supposedly leading to communism but you're, you're never going to get to communism this socialism is just oh, no, it's, it's going to sure. degrade because the idea correct me if I'm wrong but the idea is for government to kind of uh, usurp absorb everything mm -hmm. and then once they have control of everything then they can distribute it equally and then just with their way themselves so that we have this perfect uh, community. That's never going to happen in real life, though, because once, when government gets, when government appropriates everything to itself, it's never going to get rid of it. Yeah. It's never going to disperse it among everyone. So all we're going to have, we're going to be left with is... Well, well Marxist, was, Marxism is supposed to bring us the scientific understanding of history. But if you look back in history, governments do not accumulate power and wealth for the sake of just distributing it and giving it away and, and walking away and disappearing. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't, you know, people have to be out of their minds to believe this. Mm -hmm. But remember, <clears throat> one of the sins against the Holy Ghost, for which there is no forgiveness possible, is the, um, the resistance to known truth. Now, people know what the truth is, and they will not accept it. They're just so adamantly opposed to it. It's an act of the will. They simply will not accept it. It reminds you of Satan himself. I mean, Satan knew the consequences of what he was going to do. And he did it anyway, right? He simply <clears throat> would not accept. Even to this day, he doesn't accept it, you know. It felt a lot of good it does him, but he just refuses to accept it. The result is he, he, he's, the pri he's the biggest powder in all creation. <laughs> he feels sorry for himself, he got a raw deal, but he knew exactly what he was doing when he did it. And uh, that resistance to known truth, that absolute refusal to admit the truth, <clears throat> because I don't like the truth, you know. I'm not God, I will not accept that. <clears throat> well, unfortunately, he has a lot of friends here on earth, and probably in hell right now. Mao, Zelen, Hitler, and the rest of them, right? Because they all wanted to play God, you know, and pretend that they were God. And now you got Saul Alinsky here, who was a formative, a major formative influence in Hillary and Obama and those people, and who dedicated his rules for radicals to Lucifer, uh, who was the first revolutionary who gained his own kingdom. And that's hell. And that's what they want to do here. Yeah. They want to extend Satan's kingdom right here and make this hell on earth. And I would say they're, they're doing a pretty good job of it. Definitely. But that resistance to known truth is what communism, Marxism, it's all about. So um, it takes an enormous grace to draw people back from that um, and um, to draw the world back from that. But Our Lady said that that grace was there for us. 
that our, our Lord had committed that into her hands, you know, and that even the conversion of Russia could have been accomplished if the Holy Father had, con had um, consecrated Russia to her Immaculate Heart with, in unison with all the bishops of the world in 1929. <clears throat> Did they not believe that she had the power to do so? Did they think that it's just too far-fetched to believe she could do so? What a tragic mistake to underestimate her. To underestimate her, right? How different the world would be now if they just had the courage to go forward. Well, here in 2017, Father, what's the antidote to Marxism? Go down and watch the eclipse. <laughs> okay. Okay. And so that's going to be, you know, that's 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 the one thing that really matters. We got to get down there into into Kentucky or wherever in Tennessee and see the eclipse, right? That's that's our main event. You know, how many people realize that this? The, don't they see some kind of parallel? Some do. I mean, the, the evangelical Protestants are all about this right now. You know, the eclipse and the future eclipses that are going to occur. With even the, well, I think that another eclipse is going to come just seven years from now. It's also kind of crisscrossing the United States from from one to another and crossing right over St. Louis, and they're, they're making all kinds of. Evangelical Protestants have a lot of information on this. <laughs> information, misinformation. You know, they. they it's hard to uh, put a lot of stock in everything they say because, well, you, you know, but anyway, uh, they claim to be relating it to events of the Old Testament and so on. <clears throat> but unfortunately, in the midst of all this, they, they will not draw the connection between this and what Our Lady said and did at Fatima a hundred years ago. You'd think there would be a very normal and think for them to do, you know, to, to say, well, look, look at that, the miracle of the sun, written by 70,000 people. I saw an article recently that said uh, 70,000 people are expected to travel along, travel to the line of the, uh, the, the, the path of the eclipse. You know, 70,000 people out there. Well, wait a minute, that's the number of people who are, who are mentioned as having witnessed the miracle of the sun, October 13th, 1917. You know, what a coincidence that is, huh? Um, but I mean, there, there's a lot of talk also about planet Nibiru, this uh, like um, dwarf star, whatever, that that really resembles the sun as uh, what the sun became at Fatima, a uh, dwarf star in the sky, this pale plate, you know, and so on. Uh, some are, are trying to draw this uh, into line with the, the Mayan calendar, which went so far and then stopped as though, you know, that was. Uh, you know, indicative that the Mayans knew that, you know, that was, there's no sense, you know, having a next day on their calendar because there wasn't going to be any. Now, you know, I, I think people can go kind of hog wild over this, you know, and, uh, but uh, at the same time that people can go hog wild, I, I do not think it is, an, um, <clears throat> I, I think it is a mistake not to see something here. Uh, because God does give signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. Jacob Scripture says that, right? There will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars, right? And um, these may well be signs, but I'm afraid they, they're mistaking the meaning of them. Even if they get it right, okay, that these are signs that God has placed there for the world at this juncture. Some might say, well, you know, this is just... You know, it was bound to happen this way, the, move, the way the sun moves, the way the, the, the moon uh, orbits the earth and all the rest. Then, you know, you play it forward and eventually, you know, its path is already charted. You know, charted for the next 100,000 years if you wanted to, right, let's say. So all of this, you can't relate it to what's happening on earth. And say, well, that's true if you don't believe in God. <clears throat> but if you believe in God and you realize that God can make these things coincide precisely to you know, give us an indication of how things are really going, and as a, as a, a commentary on the moral state of humanity, you realize that God can easily do that, and um, then you realize, well, uh, based upon what we do know, but what Ali said, I found it would be a mistake not to see some connection there. Um, unfortunately, they're missing the whole point. Our Lady is the one who told us what the point of this is. The point of it is that sinful humanity is in for a terrible catastrophe. 
a terrible punishment because of its sins. And uh, part of the, that great chastisement is Russia spreading his, her errors throughout the world. And Our Lady has uh, been sent to us as an emissary from God to show her maternal or motherly care for us and also given great uh, power from God in order to help us to avert this disaster. Um, but it all comes down to this, not no matter who we elect, not a matter of uh, whether capitalism triumphs over socialism or socialism triumphs over capitalism, because basically they're going to wind up being the same thing if they're immoral. Right? It's all going to wind up in totalitarianism under the heel of the Antichrist. You know? The answer has to be that mankind turns to God. And if Our Lady appeals primarily the Catholics of the world to turn to God and do what she's asking, and they won't do it, then, then what, where, where are we going with this? You know, quo vadis, as we saw recently, right? So um, that's why the Catholic people have to answer Our Lady's call. And hopefully um, we can you know, use the opportunities we have, like this eclipse, to make them understand. Um, that there's a connection between this 100th anniversary, the centenary of Fatima, and what's happening, what's going to happen in, in the skies above us. You know? mm -hmm. um, and just drawing a, a line right across our country. Curiously enough, the eclipse of 2017 and the eclipse of 2024 are going to <clears throat> kind of draw a big X over the entire United States of America. <laughs> And where they intersect St. Louis is like right smack in the middle of the heartland. You know, so, um, I have a hard time believing that that is just just the most uh, a peculiar coincidence. Right? I'm not going to be there, uh, you know, uh, munching popcorn and, and uh, uh, you know. The, gulping down the lemonade or whatever else they're going to drink, in the, uh, like uh, somebody in the bleachers watching the, the eclipse happen. Uh, then we, you know, those who will look at it that way and see nothing more than that, I think, are going to be sort of like the livestock, who just, just can't seem to, to uh, understand the meaning of what's happening before their very eyes. So. Mm -hmm. But we're still here, Father, so that means there's still time, right? Uh, we're still here, and God is still putting up with this time. He's still putting up with this. That means, uh, and the only reason I, I can see that uh, why is because there are people who still love our Lord, making the sacrifices, trying to do exactly as as, as Our Lady asked, and trying to get others to do, exactly, trying to convince others to do what Our Lady asked too. So yeah, I mean, there are still efforts made to consecrate ourselves to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And efforts to enable people to understand that that is what is required now, as uh, was made clear in 1943, you know, during the height of World War II, after Pope Pius XII consecrated the royal world to the Immaculate Heart. Uh, and inadequate consecration, true, as Lucia said, our Lord said, was still pleasing to him. And uh, that now we must, each and every one of us, consecrate ourselves to Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. I can only see that there is a growing, a growing, uh, I don't know what we would call it, a trend, movement, whatever, understanding of good people on earth to realize that we, we all have to make that consecration to our Lady's, our Lady's Immaculate Heart. The fact that we are trying to make that happen, I, I can only see that God is giving us the, the time and the grace we need to work on that. And as long as we're willing to continue moving forward with that, that God will give us that the time and the grace to do it. Sure, we can only help. Mm. Uh, well, these are rather weighty matters, Father, but thank you for mm. being here tonight and taking the time to discuss all of You're welcome, Tom. Thank you very no much. Problem. No problem. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady of Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you and God bless you.